uh, Georgia coast. So I came to the Texas in the end of 2012. So because I had experience in Georgia, so I was thinking, you know, I want to keep my uh, coastal ocean connection, uh, even though I saw, I saw the um, interesting and empty space in Texas estuaries. So, and I looked around, I saw, well, there's a, another national marine sanctuary uh, just offshore from Texas. So I was happy. So I contacted um, colleagues there and, uh, you know, they were very kind and offered me a berth actually on the first trip out to the Flagland Banks. And uh, just briefly to uh, give you an overview on this uh, Flagland Banks National Marine Sanctuary. So it was discovered uh, more than a century ago. And uh, the sanctuary actually first included the East and West Flagland Banks. So it was established in 1992. And then a few years later, the Stanton Bank, which is a little bit closer to the shore. I'm going to show you a map later. So that's uh, also included into the uh, sanctuary. And they're also looking at expansion of the sanctuary in the next few years, probably. And then um, these um, habitats, you know, they are actually uh, the northernmost habitat for the tropical corals. In the around the United States, uh, you know, other than Hawaii. And uh, one interesting fact about this type of habitat is that uh, these corals, the coral heads, are kind of in this pretty shallow water, roughly 20 meters. But then the structure are made of these uh, so called salt domes. So basically, that is, if you're familiar with the geology in the Gulf, uh, there's a layer of the salt coming. From the Jurassic Age, and then there is the more you know more uh, newer sediments lay on the top. So these things they interact, and there is a squeeze and pop, and then there's a sodom just erected out from the sea bottom from uh, tens and uh, even hundred meter depths of the seabed. You know, otherwise it would be flat. And in this type of habitat, the sea waters are typically pristine, but then. Um, because of the, you know, relatively proximity to the land, when you have the flood um, on the land, and uh, sometimes fresh water can influence this area. So it's kind of an um, interesting system to look at. So this is the vessel that, uh, you know, we typically rode to the Fargan Banks uh, the area. And uh, like I said, I was there a couple of times. I also sent students there a couple of times. But most of the time, the sampling were, uh, was handled by the uh, Flag Island Banks, uh, the sanctuary office, um, the staff. You know, they have been extremely helpful to, to this work. So we visited three uh, areas, east and west, the Flag Island Banks, and also Stetson Bank. So just to show you, you know, simple physics on this uh, surface water. So you can see here, this is the sea surface salinity. Uh, we started from the end of 2013. And actually, the last data that we collected was in uh, 2019, this year, in May. And, you know, there's not much of a seasonality, but then uh, there was indeed a large flooding signal recorded uh, in the middle of the 2016. And here, just to show you, Hurricane Harvey occurred in the late August. Um, so it didn't really influence the Fargan Bank area. And here, this is a sea surface temperature. And actually, my uh, student Hongjie taught me how to interpret, you know, designalize and get a meaningful slope out of a, a time series. So on the upper right corner, that's the, you know, overlap all these uh, different uh, seasonal data together, and then you get a seasonal trend. Then designalize data. So all these gray points are the regional data. So the yellow data points represent designalized data. So you can see that the temperature increase rate over the past Five plus, um, five plus years is about 0 0.27 degree centigrade per year. Okay. So, you know, that 0 0.3 degree per, per year increase sounds a lot, but then, you know, put that into the context of longer time series. So, this data I got from uh, Marisa Nato from the uh, Fragan and Banks uh, Sanctuary. And, uh, you know, I did the same thing for the integrating the, the data. You can see that. Over the multiple 
decades, the increase is not as this much. So, you know, it's 0.3 uh, degree per year. That's uh, pretty scary. So it's not too bad. But then just the past few years, it seems like there is a pretty good increase in the temperature. Okay. So now let's look at the sea surface partial pressure of CO2. So I did the same thing. So you just need to look at the yellow data points. And we saw 5.5 micro atmosphere per year increase in the uh, CO2, uh, PCO2. Okay. So, and then again, I did analysis for the pH. And there is a decrease about 0 0.0048 per year. So keep in mind, these are all down the sea surface. So having uh, seen the PCO2 pH um, trend, and you may wonder what happened to omega, which is the carbonate saturation state. Okay. But then based on what we have so far, um, I did a regression, although uh, statistically it's not significant. So, and, uh, but the you know, good thing is that omega values range about 3.37 to 4.15. So for now, they look okay for the corals living there. And I also did the same thing for the total dissolved uh, CO2 or DIC. So the slope is 2.1, which would be consistent with the trend of ocean acidification. Okay, but then, you know, this is also the regression wasn't uh, significant. So just based off these uh, non-significant regressions, uh, definitely we would need a longer time record to show the, um, the real good uh, temporal trend. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at the correlations between the PCO2 and sea surface temperature, pH with temperature and also omega with respect to arachnid, the temperature, you can see that temperature really plays a, a dominant role in controlling variations. So part of the reason is that, you know, we saw the increase in PCO2, a decrease in pH, the significant trend, but then the lack of trend for omega could be, you know, uh, you know other than the shot record could also be because of the temperature increase so that omega doesn't show as much return as pH and PCO2. Okay. So, so regardless, let's put the numbers into the perspective. So for this uh, Fragment Banks area, northwestern Gulf of Mexico, pH decreased 0 0.0048 per year, uh, PCO2 5.5 microamsphere per year, omega, you know, not for now, it's zero. And then compare the pH change to what people have observed in the open ocean. You can see the decrease is uh, more significant, you know, greater decrease. And at the same time, PCO2 increase is also greater than uh, what you would see in the uh, open ocean. So that's in the surface. So let, let's go to a little deeper into the subsurface water. Okay. So in 2016, um, I think a bunch of, uh, uh, I don't remember, it's the tourist, uh, kind of, they were diving there, they discovered in the east uh, Frog Island Bank, there is, uh, the water was strange. And then later on, um, the sanctuary recorded kind of a pretty severe uh, local die-off of the corals. So as a result, uh, the sanctuary office requested a rapid response crews from the geochemical and env environmental research group in the Texas NAM. And the city marker was in charge of it. And then on this uh, cruise, um, Dr. Matt Howard was actually the chief scientist. And unfortunately, he passed away um, just a, a year ago, more than a year ago, and I uh, never got a chance to meet him. Uh, he was the one that actually helped to collect the deeper water samples for me so I could compare what we had in 2007 and uh, with the data from 2016. So that's pretty stark contrast between two years. And actually, that's the, everything all worked together uh, prompt us to 
think harder just on this uh, subsurface water changes. So I'm uh, very thankful for that. So here is the map. You can see that all these uh, orange triangles were uh, sites that were covered by the rapid response crews. And uh, I had the data from the three uh, uh, stations along the transect of the Gulf Stream. Okay, so I look at the comparison between 2007 and 2016. That's a pretty large um, difference. So then, uh, just a little off topic, uh, we were invited by uh, the uh, sanctuary office to convene at uh, Galveston to discuss what's going on with the, the die-off. Uh, so in this picture, you can see, so this is uh, uh, Steve uh, DiMarco and then Rob Hetland, who is also on this project. And, uh, and people are, are as far as uh, from Massachusetts and then from Florida. You see uh, a pretty diverse group gathered together uh, to look at the issue. You know, even though there was no smoking gun on what happened to this uh, uh, buy-off event, but then you know the good thing for well, I, I don't think it's a good thing, but then interestingly, you know, we found this deeper water changes you know, just by comparing the um, the two different years. And then just uh, want to ask a question: you know, what happened uh, on the larger scale? Okay, so here is the map again. So this is the transact. And I had I had the data from 2007, okay, and then so this is data from 2016, and then I knew actually it's on the day of the workshop that we had in Galveston. Um, I remember that there was uh, another cruise uh, led by uh, Leticia Bavero uh, from uh, OML. So I just uh, asked for help with uh, you know the data interpretation. So before I go to the data, so I would kind of is to Leticia, so that she can give you an overview on this, uh, all these GOMAC cruises. Leticia, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for the introduction, Xinping. So, um, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, excellent. So, this is just a very short introduction to the GOMEC program. So, um, the GOMEC cruises are um, sponsored by NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. Um, as part of OAP's portfolio, um, they um, sponsor cruises that monitor ocean acidification conditions along the coasts of the US. Um, initially, GOMEC stood for Gulf of Mexico and East Coast Carbon, and uh, the transects um, are what you see on the left-hand side figure. So they covered most of the um, east coast and part of the Gulf of Mexico going up to the Galveston line in Texas. We did a repeat of that in 2012, um, but we had fewer days. And as a result, we were forced to um, cut the Galveston line, so we didn't get all the way to Texas in 2012. And then after that, it became obvious that we um, needed to split the cruise into two components, that one that would focus on the East Coast only and one that would focus on the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and we wanted to do this because we realized that the different water masses that were present um, had a first order impact on the ocean acidification conditions. So we wanted to capture inputs and, outflo and outflows um, into the Gulf. Um, and with one cruise exclusively dedicated to the Gulf of Mexico, we were able to extend um, our monitoring efforts. And that's the um, figure that you see on the lower right hand side, where we conducted 11 transects. Um, which included for the first time um, Mexican and Cuban waters and the uh, Yucatan Channel and Florida Straits. Um, we also increased our sampling in the western um, part of the U.S. Um, Gulf of Mexico. So on top of reoccupying the um, Galveston line, we also did one station in the East Flower um, Garden Banks 
and a deal station. So we stayed for 24 hours in the West Flower Banks and we did um, eight CTD stations during that time period. And I have to say that our transects normally go from as close to the coast as we can get to deep water so that we can capture uh, both ends, um, the, the ocean and the coastal ends of the, of the carbon system. And with that, I think I'll give it back to you, Jinping, so you can show everyone what you did with the Galveston line data. All right, thanks a lot. Yep. So uh, we we're talking about the, the GOMAC cruises. And just to show you, I was there too. So this is a picture uh, taken from 12 years ago, almost exactly, well, a month over. Uh, so that's no uh, uh, shape round brown. Um, so I can assure you that my belly didn't grow since then. So this is the first uh, GOMAC cruise, uh, the transact. And then this is the, the third one. Okay, so the, the two transacts overlapped. Okay, and then, let's see. You know, if I plot uh, the physics, uh, physical data together, the potential temperature versus the salinity, you know, the three stations on this uh, Galveston transact and also all the stations uh, that uh, were covered during the rapid response cruise. You can see that um, roughly uh, below 100 meters, the water had been pretty consistent in terms of the potential temperature and salinity. So, and then this is the 300, uh, roughly 300 meter. Uh, so I'll be uh, firstly going over the, the relative deeper water, and then I'll show you a bigger transact comparison between the two. So you can see that here, this is, these are basically the data that are interpolated uh, across different isopycnal surfaces. So for those of you that are not familiar with isopycnals, it basically represents the water that have the same density. Okay, so you can see that there is a little bit of variation in terms of the water depth at the fixed uh, water density. And uh, salinity, uh, pretty small variation, and potential temperature even smaller. And total alkalinity, you know, across the three years, uh, there's very small variation, you know, almost uh, on the same orders of magnitude as the analytical um, uh, precision. So just look at chemical, you know, physics looks similar, uh, but look at chemistry. And I also interpolated the total dissolved uh, CO2 or DIC across the different isopycnal surfaces. You can see that. The blue squares are from 2007. And the green triangles were from the 2016. And then the red dots circles were from the GOMAC 3. So GOMAC 1, 16, 2016 rapid response, and then GOMAC 3. So there is a pretty consistent increase in the DIC concentration in this. Uh, uh, depth segment of the subsurface water. And then if I plot, you know, I did the same thing for the apparent oxygen utilization. You can see similar patterns. And O7, the GOMAC 1 was lowest. You know, uh, by the way, AOU, a apparent oxygen utilization basically represents efficiency uh, relative to the saturation concentration. Okay. So there is also an increase in AOU. That means more oxygen consumption across time, at least in the summer season. And then if I uh, interpolate all these nutrients together, so I didn't have the nutrients from the 2016 cruise, but you can see that uh, silicate is a little bit strange because, you know, um, 17, uh, the GOMAC-3 appear to have uh, less silicate uh, production. But if you look at, you know, this uh, so-called soft tissue nutrients, nitrate and phosphate, the GOMAC-3 uh, beta have much higher nutrient nitrate and uh, nitrate nitrite together and the phosphate concentration compared to the GOMAC-1. Okay, so just a little bit of uh, traditional uh, ocean biology geochemistry. You know, there's uh, this famously known right field uh, reaction stoichiometry. You have uh, photosynthesis and remineralization. And basically they follow uh, a ratio of uh, 100, 138 uh, over 106 over 16 and 1 for oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So what I did uh, next was to basically, I used oxygen, nitrate, and uh, phosphate, each of the three, 
to calculate how much of carbon would have been released based on per unit consumption of oxygen or per unit production of the nitrates and the phosphate. And then average can get there. So that this uh, DIC uh, signal would be considered as from uh, the respiration. So subtract this DIC out of the total observed DIC difference, and that would give us, you know, that's potentially that's a result of uh, the uptake of the anthropogenic CO2 from the atmosphere. So uh, just to ignore all these uh, gory details about calculation, basically what we got was uh, 60 to 70 percent of the CO2 increase in the subsurface uh, was due to the uh, increase in respiration. And then the rest of it comes from uh, the anthropogenic CO2 uptake, essentially. So this uh, study was published in marine chemistry last year. So then let's move uh, to a little, you know, a, a larger scale, a wider uh, coverage of, uh, of the transacts. And uh, first, I want to briefly mention. Uh, the two major problems that the oceans is facing, uh, other than the plastics that everybody also knows. So ocean acidification as a result of the increase in the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, this is the latest picture I just got actually from yesterday uh, from NOAA website. And just to compare uh, what people observed last year and then this year, there's a greater than three parts per million increase over the year period. So ocean acidification is because of the CO2 invasion into the, into the ocean. And then the other problem is on ocean deoxygenation. So some of you may have heard that there's an expansion of the so-called oxygen minimum zone in the global ocean. So you can see one example is that, um, I forgot to put the citation here, but then here, this is the paper about that. And uh, these are the, isoclass, so uh, for 90 micromole per kilogram, you can see over this is a time series plot from 1960s to the May 2000. Okay, so you can see there is a expansion of the low oxygen water in this uh, subsurface, the oxygen minimum zone you know, across uh, quite a few different ocean basins. Okay, and at the same time, you know, there's open ocean in the Gulf. And we have heard a lot about the eutrophication problem. And, you know, the eutrophication really typically happens, uh, because of the river input of the nutrients. So one major source of nutrients is coming from Mississippi and Atchafalaya system. Um, so the, I got this image from the Gulf of Uh, so this is the one example of the low oxygen condition in this, uh, relatively shallow uh, water column, you know, less than 50 meters, roughly. So the, the net red batch group has been a leading effort for the past 30 or 35 years. And I, uh, I was uh, fortunate uh, to participate in uh, quite a few of their cruises over the years, and I've been always grateful for that. So the question uh, we want to ask is, you know, there is a nutrient influence on the shelf, and what if, you know, whether any, is there any influence in the deeper water? Okay, so basically we want to ask the question whether there is an expansion of oxygen minimum zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And this, you know, is not without uh, justification because based on George Shear's uh, modeling, um, he said that there's a 70% of the river carrying nitrogen is uh, exported to the, uh, from the shelf. And also given the coupling between the oxygen and carbon, and you know, is there any acidification signal in the subsurface? So just to show you, you know, this is bigger scale, uh, in addition to the three stations that we use for that paper. Uh, so the data was, was shared uh, um, by uh, Leticia with me uh, last year. So you can see that I plotted, you know, this is again, the Galveston transact. You can see that the white dash lines Represent the isoplast for the 125 because you know it's not uh, uh, it didn't reach hypoxic, but still 125. I use this as criteria, so that's in 2007. Uh, on on the right, you can see there is an expansion of this uh, relatively low oxygen water um, 
between the two years. Okay, so so that's we look at it through the you know the vertical plot. The scale is on the water depth or water uh, uh, close to the uh, depth of uh, this pressure. Right. And uh, this plot is a little different. You know, um, on the y-axis, you can see here I actually use the potential density, and you know the surface looks slanted because in the coastal water it has lower salinity, so density is lower. And then if you go offshore, you know this is actually sea surface, but then offshore has higher salinity, so that density is greater. And then the black curves represent the uh, water depth. Okay, so compare if you compare the 2007 and 17. Uh, in the very surface, you know, about 20 meter, looks like there is a you know basic subtract data from 2007 out of the data from 2017, and the surface water was a little warmer, a little saltier in 2017, and uh, below that um, it was uh, slightly cooler and slightly uh, you know less in salinity. So. Just to uh, kind of uh, interpret why it is so, you know, there's a difference between the two years. And uh, this is the discharge from the Brazos River, which is the, you know, the closest river, the relatively large river in the uh, well, largest in Texas. So the discharge from 2007, and that's around the uh, data collection. So you can see uh, in the earlier part of the year, there's quite a bit of a discharge from the river. And then that's the 2017. You can see it had, had been pretty quiet a few months leading up to the 2017 GOMAC cruise. Okay, so, and uh, based on the modeling work by uh, Rob Hetland's group, you can see that in 2007, there is a significant, substantially more presence of the Brazos River water in this uh, area. And here, uh, well, this is now basically represent the transact. So you can see, you know, this explains. Uh, I think uh, why in 2017 there was uh, more, you know, saltier water in the Galveston transect. So now let's look at the chemistry again. So this is the the in, uh, interpolated uh, BIC and the dissolved oxygen uh, along the Galveston transect, and then this is from 2017. So only looking at this figure, you can see, you know, there's slight change uh, between the two years. And then what I did was next, next was uh, subtract 2007 data uh, out of the 17. So you can see that, you know, that's the, the top most fresh line represents 50 meter isoplast. And you can see that uh, there is a substantial increase in DIC and substantial decrease in the dissolved oxygen. If you look at the color scale, you know, the increase of DIC is about 70, up to 70, and then similar amount of uh, oxygen decrease, you know, compared to the years. Okay, so, and then from this, what I did was to calculate the pH and the carbonate saturation state based on the total alkalinity, DIC, and also the nutrient information. And you can see that there is a ton of lower pH water um, can come up to less than 50 meters. Oops. And also the same thing for the omega decrease, carbon saturation state decrease. And this is not parallel to the water depth and it appears to be, you know, there is a upwelling signal as well. So potentially, you know, if this uh, is there and you either um, periodically or there all the time, you know, this type of a behavior could influence the ecosystem just along the shelf slope rate. Okay. So, you know, I kind of put the title as the uh, subsurface acidification in 10 years, you know, strictly speaking, we only have two snapshots. So just take that, uh, you know, uh, grain of salt. And uh, I did uh, the calculation, you know, there's maximum pH decrease about 0 0.125 and the omega decrease 0 0.7. And then also put that into perspective. You know, I assume th if this were a linear change, there would be a 0 0.0125 uh, 
of a pH decrease per year, and then 0.07 of omega decrease per year. And then also put this into perspective. Again, the open ocean in the Atlantic, 0.002, okay? And in Pacific, 0.0017. And then compare with a 10-year data series in the Caribbean Sea that uh, Dwight Blackfield did uh, from uh, more than 10 years ago. You can see that omega, you know, the values in the subsurface water were much greater than what people observed in the surface ocean. So, and also I then did the same thing just to subtract the respiration signal out of the total DIC. So this is what I got similar to the comparison between the rapid response and the three stations along transect. Uh, it's about a 60 to 80. Still, the majority of the uh, DIC increase was, can be attributed to the respiration, and the rest can come from the anthropogenic CO2 uh, uh, uptake. So what could be behind this change between the two years? Uh, I got this uh, discharge data from uh, USGS. Uh, so that is in 2007. So this gray bar basically represents when the uh, month, about a month period before the, the cruise uh, covered the transact. Then this is from 2017. So you can see there is a substantially more uh, river discharge coming off from, uh, uh, from Mississippi. So as you know, if you have more of the river discharge, it could bring more nutrients to the, to the shelf. And then potentially it may lead to uh, export of the nutrients, you know, access export to the, to the off the shelf. So it's only a hypothesis at this point. So just to summarize the previous findings, we basically saw there's a subsurface acidification still, you know, be mindful that we had only two snapshots. And uh, strictly speaking, this is not a trend, but just comparison. But still, if this were a trend, it is greater than the surface ocean acidification. And then we uh, kind of suspect that leaks nutrients from the shelf may play a role in this uh, increase in the acidification signal and also the expanding uh, OMZ, okay. And also, of course, there's an anthropogenic CO2 increase as well. So having said that, you know, definitely we don't have a, a sense of what the seasonality would play in this uh, type of comparison. So that's what we're set to find out. Okay. But then keep in mind that you know, this is actually a, a work by uh, the last one, the paper uh, published by uh, Katia Fennel's group. They did predict that in the future, eutrophication could get worse on the shelf. You know, if it can get worse on the shelf, you know, the shelf slope region is right, uh, rightly there, and then it could receive additional nutrients coming from the shelf. So then we'll just go uh, into the third part. Uh, kind of a brief inter uh, uh, introduction of the um, new project funded by NOAA's OEP program. So Texas like Frontier and then, uh, you know, Northwestern Gulf of Mexico, another frontier for us. And the title of the project is Ocean Acidification on a Crossroad. And you know, we basically kind of inter integrate the enhanced respiration due to nutrients, upfalling physical force, and then there's also increase in atmospheric CO2. You know, it's kind of ubiquitous everywhere. And then there are interactions in Northwestern Gulf of Mexico. So it will start uh, very soon um, when we start the new semester. And then the project team, uh, well, I forgot to mention, you know, this uh, OEP funded and then also the IOS uh, provide a, a, a kind of a funding for us to do the data management. So the pro project team uh, in includes uh, myself and my colleague Lei Jin, uh, who is the statistician, and then Leticia from AOML across the South, and uh, colleagues uh, Steve DiMarco, Rob Petland uh, from Texas A&M, and uh, Steven uh, Gaianello, who is working at Hart Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies, and is the mostly in charge of the data management and sharing and integration. So we have uh, three questions. So what is, uh, first one is, what is the fact of nutrient input on the seawater company chemistry in the shelf slope region? 
And then how does the carbon chemistry re respond you know, spatially and temporarily? You know, we want to find out the seasonal effects. And the third one is, uh, can we really do predictions you know, with the short-term and long-term uh, projections in, the, in this region? Okay. So the project components, uh, the first two are the traditional way of sampling. We will have uh, an away measurement, and we will collect water column uh, samples uh, in this uh, shelf slope region. And uh, we will deploy the sensors, the pH and PCO2, in the Frog and Banks National Marine Sanctuary. And also, we'll have the wave gliders. Uh, uh, Steve DeMarco's group will be in charge of that. And we'll just uh, deploy this. And I will just actually hand this microphone to him a little later on uh, so he can uh, give you uh, just a very brief overview on this uh, gadget. And also, we will try to integrate. The, the plant, the, the four SCOMAC crews along this uh, same line uh, for this project. And then this project also includes numeric modeling by Rob Hutton's group and also the statistical modeling by my colleague here at Tanya uh, TC. Then GCOOS uh, is, will play a vital role in this project. Uh, Philemon Gallianello will be in charge of the data integration and the sharing. Then the final objective is to produce results for the Optimized monitoring of ocean acidification in the northwestern Gulf of Mexico. And uh, as required by NOAA, and uh, we're also fortunate that uh, colleagues step up to help, and uh, we formed an advisory committee. So here are the few members Katya Fano from Dalhousie University up in Canada, and Kim Yates at USGS in St. Petersburg, and then um, Barb Kirkpatrick from uh, uh, GCOOS, and uh, George Xie from LSU, Louisiana State, and last but not least, Emma Hickerson, who has been instrumental in you know, our uh, work in the Flag and Bank area, uh, is also on the advisory committee. So for now, let me see I can hand this over to Steve. Can you, uh, okay, can you go ahead? Yeah, so you can hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm Steve DeMarco. Um, I'm at uh, College Station, and I'm speaking to you from the center of the universe, the Geochemical and Environmental Research Group, GERG. So uh, my part of this program, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this, and uh, I'm working with Xinping and and Letitia and 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 Hetland again. Uh, we're going to be doing some of the observational work. Uh, most specifically, we're going to be using the liquid robotics wave glider. So we have an SV3 here at GERG, and uh, this is a picture here on September 8, 2017, just a few days after Hurricane Harvey uh, came uh, and left, uh, and and we went out in the wake. So we are loading it uh, onto the uh, the, the Mighty Manta, the, the Flower Garden Bank's uh, marine sanctuary uh, vessel. And, uh, and uh, the lower right picture is showing really all that, uh, uh, th that mucky fresh water that was being uh, expelled from the Gulf of Mexico, or expelled to the Gulf of Mexico from people's yards uh, on September 8th. Uh, in the inset there, it's showing uh, just a map uh, off of Galveston. and uh, uh, we were deploying this uh, the system really to to monitor the fresh water that was leaving from Galveston Bay, uh, with the goal of wondering if uh, was that fresh water going to make it all the way to the Flower Garden banks or not. And uh, and so the next slide here shows. Uh, so I think if you click on that there, Xinping, uh, in the middle of the picture, if the yeah, animation. Well, whoops. Let me just start the video. There you go. So that, that's just us on the back of the Manta. Uh, I think I'm in the lower right corner there uh, with a stick in my hand uh, deploying this. Uh, the water at, at that location, uh, the, and this was just about two miles uh, uh, south and east of Galveston, was the, the salinity was about uh, nine. Nine. Uh, 
so we deployed it there uh, and we left it in the water. These liquid robotics wave gliders uh, could stay in the, in the ocean for up to uh, a year or more. Uh, the sensors that we had uh, post Harvey was just the CTD. And uh, we will be putting for this project a uh, Turner fluorometer. It'll have the CTD. It will also have a Pro Oceanus uh, CO2 sensor and a uh, CFET for pH. So we'll be getting time series every couple of minutes. Uh, and we'll be getting a space series because we'll get, we have GPS on this. Uh, this figure, and this is my last figure, and um, is and it's just to show you that we can get a time series. So there's the salinity temperature uh, series from the uh, about the 40 days that we uh, had that deployed. It really does show that there was uh, no real flood, fresh water that went out to the flower garden banks. The space series uh, in the upper right really solidifies that with that yellow color sh saying that it really stayed. Uh, uh, salty that entire time that we had this deployed. Uh, uh, if you don't know much about the uh, liquid robotics w wave glider, I'll just say that uh, it is a really versatile uh, piece of equipment. Uh, it did exactly uh, what we wanted it to do. It, it transited, uh, if you look on that space series, it transited to the uh, our buoy, the TABS buoy F, te the Texas Automated Buoy System TABS, which I'm, I'm also the PI of that project. Uh, we sat there and uh, uh, and had it sit on location at F, make that triangle pattern. Uh, once we were convinced that it was not that fresh water was not going to go uh, offshore, it was going to go down coast. Uh, that's when we sent it out to the flower garden banks, and uh, and then we we did that trapezoidal pattern uh, for another couple of weeks. And you can see that in the time series as well, uh, right on, above the word salinity. You can see that the salinities were around sixty. Uh, or 36, 36.1 for most of that time. So we plan to deploy this uh, every year as part of the project. We hope to keep it out at around 90 days and uh, uh, per year and, uh, and reporting those data back in real time. And we should be getting that data via the GQs uh, website. And so in real time via GQs. So uh, Shimping, that's all I got. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll just briefly, you know, uh, the, the last uh, section of this uh, talk is uh, Leticia will take over again to give you the plan of the fourth GOMAC cruise to the Gulf. Uh, Leticia, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. So I'll keep it brief to allow some time for questions. Uh, but um, as Xinping mentioned, we are planning to conduct our fourth GOMAC cruise in the summer of 2021. Um, we plan to make mostly a repeat of what we did in GOMEC 3. What you see on the left-hand side um, is a transect that we did for GOMEC 3. We have a number of participating institutions that um, will most likely participate in GOMEC 4 as well. So that's a variety of U.S. institutions that includes NOAA, NASA, the National Park Service, um, the University of Miami, the University of Southern Mississippi, University of South, South Florida, NC State, University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and um, Xinping's group will be joining us as part of this project that we have together. And then we have several Mexican colleagues that will participate as well. Um, during this cruise, we will measure the four um, parameters from the carbonate systems, that's DIC, pH, total alkalinity, and PCO2. Um, we will also measure oxygen, nutrients, sedum, um, and a variety of parameters that you can see um, in the slide. The main change uh, compared to GOMEC3 is the part in the plot that you see kind of scratched out in the southern part of the Gulf of Mexico. And that's because that was not the initial plan. Um, if you can click Ping, just mm -hmm. click once. So what happened was we were um, impacted by the passage of a hurricane, which forced us to deviate from our initial course. So uh, nature God's willing, we won't have another hurricane on GOMEC 4. And then the idea is to complete um, a loop around the whole coastal area. Um, including the part in, south, in the south of Mexico that we didn't um, manage to get to 
in Gomex 3. And that's about it, Xinping. Great, thanks a lot. Yeah. So I think that is it. That was it. And uh, thanks uh, to Steve, uh, this last minute request I sent to him. <laughs> I texted him actually, he was uh, willing to, to help. Thanks a lot again. So that's it, uh, Jen, you can take over. Thank you guys so much. No, thank you. And thanks, Steve. That was great. It was like a, uh, a nice little surprise there uh, for everyone. So, no, thank you very much, uh, Jinping, Leticia, Steve. Um, great presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, just to, to act, ask directly. Or if you'd rather uh, type in a chat in the chat box, that's great too. Uh, we have about five minutes left. Um, so go for it. Well, I'll be on standby. Hi, Jinping. This is Kim Yates. Oh, hi, Kim. Hi. Uh, one question for you. Have you guys considered um, adding nitrogen isotopes to your sampling? Uh, Leticia, for you as well, to see if you can sort of target a continental input of nutrients. Or nutrients. No, we didn't. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, um, no, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, put this here. Um, but uh, from, you know, I'm not a nitrogen person. Uh, if we only look at, you know, but let me ask you first, uh, what uh, nitrogen source are you going to be uh, looking at from the organics or from the nutrients? So I, I'm not a, a nutrient chemist either, a nitrogen isotope chemist, but we, I think especially if you could get them added to the GOMEC cruises mm -hmm. and you could sort of get a distribution of nitrogen stable nit nitrogen isotopes looking for those lower per mil concentrations from continental inputs mm -hmm. um, and I'm not even sure maybe if you're close enough to the coastline you can even start might even be able to target some of the sources of anthropogenic nutrient input relative to for example the flower garden uh, mm -hmm. bank station yeah. maybe you could start deconvolving how much of the nutrient input there is from some of that uh, freshwater continental influence versus remineralization, um, denitrification, those kind of things. And I'm not 100% sure. Again, I'm not a nutrient chemist, but it might be something to look into. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll put a note to this, and uh, uh, we'll see what we can do for, for this aspect. Yeah, um, and, and from GOMEC, we don't have anyone who's planning to do it, um, but we do have space on the ship. So that's a good idea. And if there's someone who's interested in coming and doing that, mm -hmm. they should contact me because this is a good time frame to start planning for that. It's a, it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. It might be worthwhile re reaching out to maybe like Jennifer Robbie, um, okay. who's doing the, the um, WizPro nutrient sensor um, sampling thing starting this year. Oh, I know great. she's, she's going to be running all the nutrients for uh, validation of those instruments, and maybe that's something she would be interested in. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Frank miller Carger. Can I ask a uh, yes, question? Frank, yeah, Frank, can you hold on just one second? Because I, I, I want to just uh, add something to what that last question was. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim, that's a really great idea. And, uh, and Xinping, uh, Rick Coffin has some preliminary data from 2017. Uh, before uh, this is prior to Harvey on some of those ni uh, nitrogen isotopes. Oh, I didn't know that. And they did it. Uh, and he collected, I haven't seen the data. I know he collected samples uh, right. and he, from Corpus all the way to the flower garden. So, uh, right. so that, that's a really good idea uh, to maybe add to this upcoming crew for us. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Frank. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, uh, thanks, Steve and Jinping and uh, everyone. Really great presentation thank you so much and I, I'm wondering what what the ultimate objective is of measuring these parameters and, and trying to understand seasonal and longer term, term changes and I, I assume that it's trying to understand the impact on on life and so I wonder and I'm really glad to see that the Gomez cruises are gonna collect some 
form of organisms from plankton to uh, you know ichthyoplankton and phytoplankton. So is, is there a, a, a way to put this in a longer term context and uh, organizing the data in a way that can be incorporated into the, uh, what we're working with GQs and with Matt Howard specifically, we had a, uh, a, we started this effort called MBON, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, where GQs is mm -hmm. in training data in the Darwin Core format. So if, if I can encourage people to, to use that uh, schema, and try to see if we can put things in a long-term context to see if any of these changes have an impact on organisms. That'd be great. Right. So, uh, Leticia, you want to uh, go ahead and talk about the GOMAX first, then I can follow yeah. up with the... Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, we actually already did um, some plankton toes on GOMAX 3. Um, it was a collaboration between Frank Hernandez at USM and Sharon Herska at CISES in Mexico. So we did, I think, about 50 something toes along the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm not sure how far along they are with the um, analysis of the samples they collected, um, but they, they, um, they are expected to make the data public and I assume it would be sent to MBON, but I would have to double check with Frank on that. And the plan is to keep doing that moving forward in the next um, GOME cruises. So, um, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, and also for uh, this project, this actually, this is uh, um, um, in the response to uh, Noah call that uh, the goal was to uh, do this optimized monitoring, you know, provide uh, uh, either, you know, the, the call basically was either you have data, you synthesize, and uh, uh, recommend to know uh, where to put things, the, the facilities to monitor ocean acidification. The other is if this area doesn't have a whole lot of data, you can go ahead and collect data. So our project falls onto the second category. And then this uh, ultimate goal uh, definitely is to provide information, you know, provide data first, and then information for the future uh, long, longer term uh, monitoring of ocean acidification. And also for the, uh, the project itself, uh, our interest is also on, you know, this uh, potential upwelling and then that brings up the, uh, the low pH, uh, low omega water to the shelf slope break. And in this, along this uh, shelf slope break, there are indeed a wide distribution of these popular corals and they represent very significant and also fragile ecosystem that can su sustain quite a bit of the productivity and a lot of other things. So, you know, that we, we do have this uh, biological component in mind, although we're not really specifically testing how this water change, uh, at least during the next three years, how the water chemistry change would affect the, the corals or other organisms. No, thanks, Xinping. I really appreciate that you have that context in mind. I, 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 I think the point is that if we make all these measurements to understand life and we don't always focus on measuring life along with all of these we just hope that it happens somehow by magic or by somebody else and so the, somehow we it, it, i would like to encourage us all to think of this in a more integrated way it's hard to make direct links to impacts on biology on any one cruise and as you say over the long term that may be possible but the data has to be collected Thanks, Frank. Unmute. All right. Well, we are four minutes over time. Um, thanks, everybody, for your questions. And if you'd like to continue the conversation, again, feel free to send me an email. Um, or you can give me a call, and we can get you directed to the right person. Um, Steve, thanks for, uh, again, uh, jumping on board and uh, writing a comment to Emily. Um, I was just going to read off of her statement. Um, but again, I think this is good. And again, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Uh, thanks to our presenters. And um, stay tuned for our next webinar. Uh, it's still to be determined. So thank you again. And you guys have a great day.
Thanks, Jane. Thank, thank, thank you, Janet.